crisis is when you are overwhelmed by negative events or situations or circumstances causing you to feel helpless or hopeless. It is where the events that are overwhelming you are beating at your well-being. Whether it's a health crisis, family crisis, monetary crisis, mental crisis, it's beating you down. And there isn't a solution clearly in sight. But where do you go when your life is in a crisis? In other words, none of the places you look to to resolve it can help you. That's our situation in John 11. Now let's set the stage. Lazarus is sick. And we know from the story he's sick unto death because it would only be a few days later he would die. So he's not just sick, he's seriously sick. And whatever medical help there was was insufficient to resolve the problem of his medical crisis. So what Martha and Mary did, the sisters of Lazarus, is they went to Jesus. They sent word to Jesus. You and I would call that today, they prayed. They sent word to Jesus. Jesus, our family member has a crisis. This is a life and death crisis. And we're crying to you to resolve the crisis. Now I want you to observe something. We're told in verse 3 some of their prayer requests. The one whom you love is sick. We're told in verse 5, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So evidently, spiritual people get sick. So they prayed. They sent word to Jesus. The one whom you love is sick and it's serious. Jesus sends back a word. This sickness, verse 4, is not to end in death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified. That's pregnant with theology. He says, first of all, I've got good news for you. Bad as it is, this sickness is not unto death, but God wants to get something out of it. So let me give you and me and us theology and whatever the sickness is you're facing, the scenario of the crisis that you will face, God will allow things in our lives that are not preferential to us but are glorifying to him. This sickness is not unto death but it is for the glory of God. So one of the questions you must ask and answer in prayer when you're in, when I'm in, when we're in a crisis is you must answer the question, God, what glory do you want from my crisis? But I got a problem. My problem is verse 6. When he heard he was sick, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Come on, Jesus. Where Jesus was and where Martha and Mary were two miles apart. 
So not only does he delay, he, he delays and he close. After two days, Jesus tells his disciples, let's go to Judea, let's, let's go guys. Then he says something else, a new term for Christians. Verse 11, he said to them, our friend, because remember, Lazarus is, is close to Jesus, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go so that I may awake him out of his sleep. Verse 13, now Jesus had spoken of his death, but he doesn't say he died. He said he's sleeping. This is a different terminology. This is new. The word sleep is only used of Christians in the Bible. It's not used of the general public, only used of Christians. One thing messed me up, he, he, two days. Come on, Jesus, hurry up. Second thing messed me up is two miles. You close. But the next thing that messes me up in verse 15 is, and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there. Come on now. How are you going to be happy about it? Martha's talking. She's listening. So, there is a question on the floor. Both sisters have the same question, but they approach the question differently. Martha raises the question in verse 21. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Verse 32. Therefore, when Mary came where Jesus was, she saw him, fell at his feet, saying, Lord, if you would have been here, anybody here ever been felt God has let you down? God, God, where were you, God? To put it in another word, don't you care? Be this close, stay two days longer, and be glad. Doesn't make sense. If you would have been here, she expresses her pain and disappointment to Jesus. Point is okay to be honest in your prayers. Then neither sister is condemned because they express disappointment with God, God's son. After she expresses her disappointment, she goes on to say in verse 22, even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give to you. Whoa, I don't want you to miss this. Jesus, verse 21, I'm hurting because I needed you and you didn't come. But, however, in spite of my pain, I know my beliefs. And if you call on the Father now, as bad as this situation is, he will still honor your request. So she marries, watch this, she marries her emotions with her theology. So you want to always have a theological and doctrinal foundation when you are emoting over your circumstances. She is emoting about her pain, but retreating to her theology. That's why you need to learn doctrine. She says, look, right now I'm disappointed, but I know what I believe. And I'm going to appeal to what I believe in spite of how I feel right now. So you need to learn some theology and doctrine because that will ground you when the emotions are doing this. And when you're in a crisis, that's what the emotions do, as you'll see here in a second. Jesus says to her, your brother will rise again. She says to Jesus, yeah, I yeah, know, I learned theology, went to eschatology class, on the last day, he gonna rise. I know, I know about that. Then Jesus hits her with another theology. Can I talk some theology here? Because I want to ground you, I want to root you. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. Doctrine is critical, but doctrine is always to lead to a person. If all you get is doctrine, you may be heavy in the head with information, but light on the experience. 
you may know about the resurrection but never experience one. Because he says the resurrection that's doctrinal is tied to a person. So here's the point. The written word must always lead you to the living word. If you, see we have two extremes. Some are so orthodox with the written word that they can quote the Bible, quote the theology, quote the doctrine, but never have the experience because they are tethered to the written word alone. This other side wants to fall in love with Jesus with no doctrine. So they live on the emotion of the experience without the end underpinning of theology. You need the doctrine to know what to believe. You need the person to make it experiential in your belief. If you read the Bible but you don't see Jesus, your eyes stay closed even though your heart burned at the Bible study. He told, he told the Pharisees, he says, you, you search the scriptures, you read your Bible, but you still don't experience me. So the goal of this church, the goal of your life is through the written word to come into an experience of the living word, which the Holy Spirit offers to every believer who seeks to do that. Okay, let me run on because I'm just in the introduction. Okay, no, just kidding. But says, I'm the resurrection. He says at the end of verse 26, do you believe this? This is going to be critical. This is going to be, this will change your life. Do you believe this? She says, yes, I believe. You are the Christ, the Son of God who comes into the world. Now, it's Mary's turn. Mary not coming to Jesus. She's too disappointed. And let's tell the truth. Sometimes you're so disappointed with Jesus, you don't want to talk to him. Can anybody raise your hand and tell you you don't want to pray no more? Okay? Because he's not moving. He came too late. Should have been here yesterday. Okay? That kind of thing. So she don't want to talk to him. So Jesus calls her. He says, Mary, come on, come on. Come talk to me now. He bids us come. She gets up quickly because he invited her. And then she tells him, verse 32, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. Now, in verse 33, everybody's crying. We've got a weeping time because when you're in pain, you're going to cry if it hurts bad enough. When you have your crisis, it will bring you to tears if it hurts bad enough in your particular situation. But I feel much better in verse 35, the shortest verse in the Bible, when I read Jesus well. He wasn't too big to cry and he's the son of God. Jesus cried. Why? Because Hebrews chapter 4 verses 14 to 16 says that he sympathizes with our infirmities. He hurts with our pain. I have good news. When tears are coming down your eyes, they're coming down his eyes. Because the Bible says he feels your pain. He feels what you feel when you're in a crisis. So now, Jesus raises the question, where have you laid him? Where is he buried? So they come to take Jesus to where he was buried and he stirred up, verse 38 says, he's deeply moved within. He's moved at the sin and the pain that the world offers that creates sickness in the first place. Without sin there would be no sickness. Without, not, not personal sin necessarily, but atmospheric sin. The germs, the viruses, the bacteria that infiltrate our body, the toxins, all of that is the environmental repercussions of sin. And he was stirred up at the the crisis that they were in and the reasons for it. And so he says, stay with me here, verse 39, Martha, remove the stone. Martha's response, Martha said to him, Lord, by this time there will be a stench for he has been dead four days. You remember that delay? By this time, he stinks. Jesus said, move the stone. She says, 
Let me give you a lesson in mortuary science. <laughs> He's been dead four days. Rick mortis has set in, which means the cells have collapsed. When Rick mortis sets in and the cells collapse, it releases a green substance. When this green substance is released because Rick mortis has set in, because the cells have collapsed, that produces a stench because of the decay. He said, remove the stone. And what, what did he tell her? He said, did not I say to you, if you believe, you would see the glory of God? In other words, here it is, faith must always precede sight. Once you put sight in front of faith, because you were from Missouri, once you put sight in front of faith, you've negated faith. Faith is based on what you do not see. If you got to see it first, you won't see it. No. And how would she demonstrate faith? Not by a feeling, but by removing the stone. Because faith is not a feeling, it's an action. As you've heard me say many times, faith is acting like God is telling the truth. It is acting like it is so even when it's not so in order that it might be so simply because God said so. So you move in faith even when you don't feel it. Sometimes you're going to feel faithish. Got faith all over you. You're just feeling it. Sometimes you won't ever feel faithish, but you can know you're operating in faith because you're moving the stone. So some of us have situations that have not changed because we still have in conversations and have not touched the stone. The thing that God told us to do that we refuse to do, which keeps the stone there, which means there's no faith no matter how much church you have. Then. Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. Oh, 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 that's theology there. You're praying through a crisis. You're talking to God. But here's what you want. You want Jesus talking to God for you. See, you got to talk to him first. But what you want is Jesus to ditto the request then not until it was an act of faith Jesus says to his father I thank you that you have heard me oh 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 oh, oh, oh. I don't know so you can't miss Jesus does not waste words not only does he not waste words he does not waste tenses of words he didn't say I thank you that you hear me I thank you that you heard me. Which means we've already discussed this crisis that Lazarus is in. When they prayed the first time at the beginning of chapter 11, you and our father had a conversation. So now Jesus prays. I thank you you've heard me. I know that you always hear me. But because of the people standing around, I said it so that they might believe that you sent me. Ah, now we got a clue. Jesus holds off on answering the prayer because he wants to use the crisis to bring a lot of people to salvation. Oh, so now there is a spiritual reason for a crisis delay in spite of a prayer being prayed because there's a bigger kingdom purpose at work than just the healing of Lazarus. If you're in a crisis and God is not moved and you're operating by faith, all that means is the delay is tied to a bigger purpose point that God wants to accomplish for his glory the, uh, the amplification of the name of his son and the advancement of his kingdom so you keep praying to a crisis if you've not heard no then you keep praying so, so Jesus prays it's called intercession Hebrews 7 24 and 25 where God Jesus intercedes as our counselor he goes before us and he delivers us out of a stinky situation because guess what he says Verse 43, Lazarus, come forth. So Lazarus walks out of the tomb, kind of. Here's my final point. As he's exiting the tomb, the man who had died came forth, bound hand and foot with wrappings. His face was wrapped around with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Hmm. Wait a minute. Lazarus has life. 
But what he doesn't have is freedom. Because he's bound. His hands were bound. His feet was bound. He's wrapped like a mummy. You wrap a mummy. He's wrapped from head all the way to, to the toe. So he has life, but no liberty. Everybody here this morning who's a Christian, that means you have life, but not everybody who's a Christian has liberty. You may be bound by an addiction, bound by an emotional struggle, bound by a health situation. Something may be holding you hostage even though you have life. Now watch this. Jesus gave him life, but Jesus did not directly give him liberty. He said he told them to unloose him and let him go. Let me explain something. God, Jesus Christ wants to give every sinful person eternal life. He offers life through his blood, but he sets folk free through his people. He still does it, but he does it through his people. That's why God wants every Christian to be an active part of a local church so that you can be unwrapped if you're trapped or so you can unwrap somebody else if you have been unwrapped yourself. God never meant for you to come once a week to hear somebody preach the Bible alone. He wants you part of a family so you can be in the unwrapping, untying, and deliverance business so that you can be helping somebody else as somebody helps you. He wants us unbound from this habit, that habit, this sin, that sin, this circumstance. That's what the church is supposed to be. It's not a, a weekly event. It is a family relationship where folk are being loose and set free. That's why, that's why the book of Matthew chapter 10 verse 8 says if you've been freed, free somebody else. Galatians chapter 6, 5 verse 13 says through the liberty that you have, serve somebody else. And if you're not serving others in the family of faith, but you're only coming to serve yourself, that's not called worship service, that's called worship selfish. Because you're just in this for what you're going to get out of it. And you will always limit what God does for you if he can't work through you to do it for somebody else. So we are in the untying business of loosing people and letting them go. So in closing, I know there are many crises here. But I want you to pray through it. Even if it's gotten worse and not better. Because I want to let you know right now that God can turn things around for his own purpose. A dense fog covering seven blocks to a depth of 100 feet is composed of less than one glass of actual water. A fog covering seven blocks so you can't see even 100 feet in front of you because it's that thick, only has a glass or less of water that composes that much fog. You see, there are 60 billion droplets that are spread out of particles settling over that seven block area but it can blot out your ability to see things clearly. Many today are living in a spiritual fog. They allow a cup full of trouble, irritation, or as our text tells us today, thorns, to cloud out their vision and dampen their spirits. How do you live in the sunshine when all you see is fog? Now, make no mistake about it. On a foggy day, the sun is shining. But the question is, how can such a little bit of water cause all of this confusion? In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10, where Paul discusses the thorn. 
In verse 7, he introduces us to it, the reality of a thorn. He says, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, to buffet me. That's not buffet me. <laughs> to trouble me, to torment me, to irritate me, to exacerbate me. Or to put it in everyday, contemporary, colloquial language, to get on my last nerve. The Greek word for thorn referred to a splinter or a needle of some kind that pricked you. We've all had a needle or a thorn or, or a splinter from wood to get in our finger or toe and irritate us. It could be used of a hook that catches a fish, piercing its, its skin, of which it can't shake itself from without tearing and making things worse. A thorn is anything that nags or irritates your life on a continuous basis. A thorn is anything that nags, irritates, exacerbates, or frustrates your life ongoingly. You can't shake it. It hangs around. Paul says, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. Something to irritate me. Now, you can read commentaries galore and you have a lot of guesswork as to what Paul's thorn was. For example, Paul talks about how when he was trying to write the churches, he had trouble seeing. In fact, he had an emanuensis, a recorder who would write for him. And so some will say, well, it was his eye problem. Uh, but still others will say, well, he was always being followed by this group called the Judaizers who were undermining his ministry. And so they were an irritation to him. Maybe it was that. Paul speaks of being lonely. He says, everyone has forsaken me. Some say it was loneliness. But the Bible never says what his thorn is. And that's good. It's good that he doesn't tell us what his thorn is so you can put your thorn here. Anything that irritates, nags, frustrates, exacerbates on a continuous level. In fact, he lays it open in verse 10. He says it can be insults, distresses, persecutions, or difficulties. Some of you are having to deal with emotional thorns. Things that have to do with your feelings. You are, you are lonely. You perhaps have been single for an inordinate amount of time and you are simply tired of being alone and it pricks you, nags you, irritates you you. Or perhaps it's depression that keeps popping up and you can't shake it. Maybe it's memories or regrets. When you look back over your life, you wish you could have done things differently, but you can't because that's history now, but you've not been able to shake it. It's an emotional thorn. Others have relational thorns, people who get on your nerves. They're always popping up at the wrong time, which is any time they show up. <laughs> this could be the person living in an unhappy marriage. 
They have no biblical grounds for divorce. They feel stuck spiritually. But they are unhappy. And it becomes an irritation. It's a relational kind of thorn. Others have financial thorns. A long time trying to find a job or the right job and it's not coming through. Or perhaps you're stuck in an unhappy work situation. Or it looks like every time you try to get out of debt, just when you think you made it, something else breaks down. Something else shows up. And you can't shake this financial situation. I guess one of the worst thorns there is are physical thorns. Disabilities, chronic illnesses, headaches that won't go away, things that are wrong with your body that are not healed. It's a thorn. Please notice this phrase in verse 7. There was given me a thorn. Now, now we could spend an hour on that. He says, my thorn was a gift. Well, take your gift back. <laughs> he says, it was given me. And if you think that's bad, that God is giving away thorns. See, now you don't hear about this too much today. You hear about how he's giving blessings. Money. Cars. Houses. But let me tell you something else he's giving. Thorns. There was giving me a thorn in the flesh, in my humanity. And look at the theology here. A messenger of Satan to buffet me. God gave me a thorn and let the devil deliver it. Yes. Come on, work with that now. The thorn was handed to me, given to me. And you'll discover when you read your passage, by God. But the delivery service was a messenger of the devil. You ever looked at, a, maybe you have a, a relational thorn, somebody in your life keeps getting on your nerves, you say, you ain't nothing but the devil. <laughs> well, you are partially right. But the gift came from God. Watch this then. God is sovereign, meaning he's in charge. Nothing happens, and I mean nothing, no matter how tiny or big, that either is not caused by God, he made it happen, or allowed by God, he okayed it happening. There is no third category, like luck, or chance, or fate, words that ought not be part of any serious Christian's vocabulary. Because to have luck, chance, or fate is to deny sovereignty. You can't have an omniscient God who knows everything and something get by him. You say, but the devil is messing with me. If the devil is messing with you, God had to okay it. We all know Job, his life is falling apart. But when you read Job chapter 1, God starts it off. God says to the devil in Job 1, have you considered my servant Job? The devil says, well, the only reason he's serving you is because you're blessing him. Take away his blessings, he won't serve you. And then God tells the devil, go right ahead. I'm going to give Job the thorn and you can deliver it. If the devil is messing with you, God okayed it first. The great question of theology is why would an all-powerful God allow a lesser creature that he created, the devil, 
to do what he has done? Good question, especially when you use the word allow. See, the answer is in the question. The devil is not the devil. The devil is God's devil. He operates by permission. How do you know what you're facing is a thorn? Verse 8. Concerning this, I entreated the Lord three times that it might depart from me. If it's nagging you, irritating you, and getting on your nerves, you prayed about it, and God hadn't done anything about it, that's a thorn. Anybody got a thorn? Sticking you? Many of us are trying to get rid of something God gave you. You say, well, if God gave it, how can it be so bad? Because the devil delivered it. It was given to me. I prayed about it. I said, God, get rid of this thorn. It's sticking me. He says, I prayed three times. So I wasn't being carnal. I wasn't being sinful. I was talking to God. You, you told me, preacher, to pray. I prayed. And I still got this thorn. If you pray about something and you're a serious Christian and a serious prayer and it's a thorn because it's irritating you and God doesn't take it, that's because he's not finished with the gift. Because it's a gift. A thorn is a gift. It was given to me. Why would God give me a gift like that? Something that nags me in perpetuity. Something that won't go away day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. Why would a good God, and God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. Why would a good God give me something to prick me like this? I don't deserve this. I deserve better. Back to verse 7. There are two reasons God gives you a thorn. Number one, and because of the surpassing greatness of the revelation. The first thing, the first reason, this is very important now, that God gives you a thorn is he wants to show you some new things. Let's look at Paul's revelation here in this chapter, verse 2. I know a man in Christ, Paul's talking about himself in the third person, who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know or out of the body I do not know, God knows such a man was caught up to the third heaven. And I know how such a man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, God knows, was caught up in the paradise and heard inexpressible words which a man is not permitted to speak. Now watch this. Paul is the only man in all of history who was taken to heaven, got to see heaven, and allowed to come back to earth to discuss it. He says he went to the third heaven. There are three heavens. There is the atmospheric heaven where the clouds are, the oxygen is. There is the stellar heaven, the stars, the planets, the solar system. And then there is the throne room of God, paradise, the place where every believer goes when they die. That's the third heaven. He says, I was taken to paradise. I like what he says. He, he says, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know. In other words, it was a dimension I'm not familiar with. It was, it was an experience that is unlike any experience I ever had. See, see, I can't fully explain heaven to you. Because it operates in another dimension. It, it operates outside of space, outside of time. He says, I cannot fully explain my state. I'm not sure how to articulate it. But this one thing I do know, what I saw up there, I cannot put words together to formulate. He calls it inexpressible. One of the reasons God gives you a thorn is because he wants to show you some new things. Things 
things that go beyond what's normal for you. Things that go beyond what's average for you. So many Christians are satisfied with the normal. So they spend all their time trying to get rid of their thorns, complaining about their thorns, fussing and cussing about their thorns, asking why all day long when God is trying to show you something you've never seen before. And the thorn is a necessary part of the revelation. When God gives you a thorn, he has something new, something unique. God is going to expand your anointing when he increases your thorn. Did you just hear me? God's got something in store for you when he gives you a thorn. So the good news is if you've got a thorn, it's a gift. John McNeil was a great influencer in my life in college. And I would spend a lot of time talking with him. His house was on campus. So I would go over and I would do work for him in his house, just little odds and ends kinds of things. But that gave me a lot of time to spend. His wife would always feed me ice cream for doing work. And uh, there was a lot of affirmation that came from him as we were trying to deal with, because I'm now in Atlanta. And the civil rights thing is, you know, hot and heavy coming out of Atlanta. And so there was a lot of tension in the air. So we were always wrestling theologically and practically with the whole uh, issue of race and the Bible. It was while I was in Atlanta that I was um, denied to go to a white church there, simply because they did not want to have a, a black person in the church, and the church split over it. So there were dual tracks I was always operating on. Even when I went to college, there was a dual track because there was conservative theology even though it was in a context of social change. So that was another crisis in my life that uh, also helped prepare me for uh, an emphasis on racial reconciliation even to today. Well, Dave, one of the reasons that forgiveness is critical is not just for the person you're forgiving. It's also for the forgiver because unforgiveness holds you hostage. But first of all, we've got to understand what forgiveness is all about. So we're going to seek to clarify that, but also for the forgiven, for that person, to know that they can get right with God and they can have the opportunity to seek reconciliation because forgiveness has been offered. Well, let's get started with this look at how to follow God's ultimate example of forgiveness. We have all seen a dog being held hostage by a leash, by links in a chain that has it collared. And it can go a little distance, but once it goes too far, it's unable to go any further and many times are yanked back. Unable to be freed because they have been collared by something that limits their movement. There are some here today who are being held hostage by unforgiveness. The links in the chain on the leash involve anger, bitterness, resentment, wrath, revenge, and all of these links hook into a collar called unforgiveness. This collar hooked onto this chain owns you. Perhaps it's been owning you for days or months, maybe years or decades. One thing is for certain, you're not able to get free. It's like the button in a tourist shop that read, To error is human. To forgive, that ain't going to happen. <laughs> a man was told to tell his enemy, Happy New Year. Wish your enemy Happy New Year. He went over and he says, I wish you Happy New Year. But only one. In Colossians chapter 3, Paul the Apostle says to forgive one another in verse 13. Forgiving each other. So let's 
clarify our definition. Stick with me today because whether you need help in this area or whether you know someone who does, and we probably all do, this is no small issue, as you will see. Forgiveness means to release a person from a debt or an obligation that has been incurred. It is the choice to release a person from a wrong committed against you. Forgiveness does not mean approving or excusing or justifying or pretending not to be hurt. It's not repressing it and pushing it in the basement of your mind so that you don't have to think about it. But it is releasing by choice someone from an obligation incurred to you because of wrong done against you. Everybody here has been on both sides of the equation. We have needed to be forgiven and we have needed to forgive. Everybody here, whether small or large, has been on the forgiveness continuum. And it is the quintessential issue of human relationships. Forgiveness is that decision to push a delete button because of a wrong done against you. Now let me clarify. Forgiveness does not necessarily mean reconciliation. It's a very important distinction. You can forgive people with whom you are not yet reconciled. Forgiveness, whether reconciliation occurs or not, is the decision of the offended party to release the party that has done them wrong, whether or not we ever hook up again. Whether or not we ever become friends again. Whether or not we ever do business together again. Whether or not we hang out with each other again. That is a goal. That is a, a need. That may be something you strive to. That may or may not happen. But that does not determine whether forgiveness has occurred. So please do not make the two equal. One can lead to the other. But one is not the other. You can forgive for that which has yet to be reconciled. A Sunday school teacher asked the class, what does it take for you to obtain forgiveness for sin? What do you have to do to gain forgiveness for sin? One of the students raised his hand. I know what you must do to obtain forgiveness for sin. The teacher said, what? He said, sin. Because forgiveness assumes a wrong done. That is, an illegitimate evil that is detrimental to the person who is the offended party and who needs to be the forgiver to the person who has hurt them. Now let's clarify. Forgiveness can be either unilateral or forgiveness can also be transactional. Now let me explain what I mean. Unilateral is to go one way. Forgiving people who have not asked you to forgive them. You see, a lot of people are held hostage waiting for somebody to say, I'm sorry. But if they never say, I'm sorry, and you don't forgive, you're held hostage by what they do or do not do. Or unilateral forgiveness is forgiving someone who is unable to ask you for it. Like someone who abused you but who is now dead. Then you're held hostage for the rest of your life. Because if you're waiting for a request, that's a request that can never come. Or maybe it's a person who hurt you but you don't know where they are. They've relocated. They've, they've started a new life somewhere. You, don't, you can't locate them. So there is no way for there to be a transaction. 
That's unilateral forgiveness. That's what Jesus did on the cross. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Without you ever saying anything, forgiveness was granted. But then there is transactional forgiveness. Transactional forgiveness is forgiveness that comes because a person has confessed and repented of the wrong done against you. There's a transaction occur. In other words, it's two ways. They have come and requested forgiveness and demonstrated repentance that they are indeed sorry. They've said the words, followed up by the action, which now opens up the door for reconciliation. Reconciliation can occur when there has been transactional forgiveness that takes place. When there is no transactional forgiveness, it's merely unilateral forgiveness, then reconciliation is difficult or impossible. That's why to restore a relationship, the Bible says that Jesus paid the sins of the whole world that was unilateral, but he's offering transactional Because if you come to Christ in faith, you will be reconciled with the Father. The Father is already reconciled with you through the forgiveness of sins. But when the transaction occurs, because you come to Jesus Christ, then reconciliation with the Father can occur. So let's get this straight. Forgiveness is releasing a debt, whether unilaterally or whether transactionally. But the transactional forgiveness gives a higher potential for reconciliation depending on what the infraction was and the time needed to get over the hurt or the pain that was caused by the infraction. I remember a a man who ran into my car. He hit my car. Come to find out he was uninsured. So he had no insurance to fix my car. I have a dent in my car caused by somebody else who was unable to fix the problem. I got my car fixed. Now, what I could have done was drive around with a dent in my car caused by somebody else being mad every day that they didn't fix it. Every time I go out and see that dent, that no good driver, that uninsured driver has messed up my car. Unfortunately, a lot of folks are living with dents on their soul. A dent on the soul. A soul, somebody has run into your life and put a dent there. And you're spending so much time being mad that they were uninsured. That they couldn't fix what they dented. That you're running around and living life with a dent. That if forgiveness took place, would have been repaired by you. But you can become so angry, vengeful, and bitter that you get used to a dent. And don't know how to live without it. Because every time you see that dent, it justifies your anger at the person who caused it. for an obligation because of an offense against you. 
Please notice he says, stay with me here, in verse 13, he says, forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. He says, what makes it possible to forgive is recognizing you have been forgiven. If you lose sight of the fact that you are forgiven, it will be much more difficult for you to forgive. And there will, is nobody here who has not needed to be forgiven. Now, different strokes for different folks, but if you're here and you're saved, it's because God has forgiven you of your infraction against him. There is an inseparable link between forgiving and recognize you have been forgiven. Forgiveness is a beautiful word until you're the one that has to give it. Now we love the word when we need it. But the word becomes much more difficult when we are the ones that have to disperse the forgiveness because we are the wounded party. On the cross, God took the initiative to provide forgiveness before we ever requested it. For God demonstrated his love toward us that even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He unilaterally forgave on the cross and he wants us to be forgivers. Stay with me here because I can feel the consternation. To refuse to forgive is to burn a bridge over which you yourself must cross. If not now, one day. There are some here today who are being held hostage by unforgiveness. And because of what happened to you, how it happened, who did it, the collar is around your neck and every time you try to go, boom, the devil drags you back. And he yelling around like a record recorder in your mind. He can own you, control you, break down relationships, even that have nothing to do with the person, but you can't move forward in other legitimate relationships because of the hurt, the abuse, the pain, the stress, the struggle that was caused you. He says, I want you to forgive as you have been forgiven. When Jesus prays the Lord's prayer, forgive us our debts as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. You remember that? That's the Lord's Prayer. He says, after he says, Amen, verse 14 of Matthew 6, For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. So watch this. Many of us are walking around out of fellowship with the Father because of an unwillingness to forgive. If you have a refusal to forgive, you and God are not on the same page. You have blocked God's operation in your life. No matter how many prayers you pray, no matter how many Bibles you read, no how many church services you go to, refusal to forgive horizontally breaks down fellowship with God vertically because the vertical is tethered to the horizontal. Forgive just as your heavenly father has forgiven you. Jesus tells another story in Matthew 18. He's talking about forgiveness. Peter wants to know how many times, beginning in the verse round, verse 21, how many times do you have to forgive somebody? Because I know some of you ask him. Jesus says there was a man who owed a man millions of dollars. And he could not pay. He said, have mercy on me. I can't pay. Because he was getting ready to be thrown and sold, he and his family into slavery. It says that the king had mercy on the man and did not require him to pay. In fact, he canceled the debt. So the man is now free from millions of dollars of debt. 
He now is walking in freedom and comes across a guy who owes him a couple thousand bucks. He grabs the guy who owes him a couple thousand bucks and says, where's my money? You owe me some money and you're not paying me. The man said, have mercy on me. I can't pay. I want to pay. I will pay. I can't do it now. Have mercy. He had him thrown in jail. Say, you pay me, your life's going to be miserable. It says, one of the king's servants saw him do this. And went back to the king and told the king what he did. Says the king was furious and said, go get him. They went and they got him and he required payment. He says, I forgave you millions. You were not willing to release somebody who owed you thousands. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to hold you hostage until you pay up. And then it, the story ends with this statement. And so shall your father do to you. Or as James 2.13 says, He that hath mercy will receive mercy. The one that doesn't show mercy will not receive mercy. I love the way Ephesians puts it. Ephesians talks about the same thing. And here's what Ephesians 4 verses 30 to 32 says. It says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving each other just as God and Christ forgave you. Here it is, here it is, here it is. When you forgive, you have just crossed over into the supernatural. Let me say it again. When you forgive, as difficult as it may be, you have just crossed over from the natural to the supernatural. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is no longer sad inside of you. See, a lot of us, the word greed means to make sad. A lot of us are walking around with a sad Holy Ghost. And that's why we are sad people. A sad Holy Spirit. So we're sad in our souls. A sad Holy Spirit. That's why we are discouraged and depressed. Because the Holy Spirit is sad. He says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. How do you know the Holy Spirit is sad inside of you? Because you're walking around bitter. Because you're walking around thinking about, I'm going to get you. What goes around comes around. If you are walking around thinking that way, feeling that way, acting that way, here's another way you know the Holy Spirit is grieving inside of you because you are slandering the person that hurt you. In other words, you're taking that person's name and you are seeking any kind of damage you can do. That means that you're 